Good afternoon, Ben. How you doing, buddy? I am horribly tired. How are you? <laughs> I'm feeling that a little bit. Maybe not horribly, but definitely tired. Definitely. Oh, my God. <laughs> hey. Oh, man. oh, you know, I'm alive. Nice. That's all good. I want a, I want a nap. I'm you know, I'm not against taking naps either. So, okay. FYI, I'll put on a I'll put on a movie and we'll we'll take naps as long as you give me the credit for being here, right? Had <laughs> <laughs> a long morning of stabbing people, so I'm very tired. Were you working this morning? Yeah. And you work at Best Buy? No, nah, there's a there's a plasma donation center over uh, close to that. Um, Biomat USA Gripples. Um, okay. Yeah, it's over by Target. Yeah, I'm a phlebotomist. So yeah, I stab people for money. <laughs> I was thinking about uh, giving, uh, selling my plasma. It works out pretty good. Hmm. You get a hundred bucks the first two times you go in, and then after that, the um, the pay scale just changed this month. I guess like the first time you do it in a month when you're not a new donor, it's forty bucks. Then the next time is 45, 50, 55, and it goes up to eighty bucks. And you make like five hundred bucks a month. Damn. Yeah. How many times can you do it a week? Twice. Twice a week? Mm hmm Huh. I'm yeah, it takes like, it takes like almost nothing out of you. It's yeah. all just water and proteins, so. Huh. Yeah, it's funky. The, uh, the blood goes into a separator, and it separates the red blood cells from the plasma, and then it puts the red blood cells back. Oh, yeah. Wow. I had no idea that was even a thing when I right? applied. And I was like, what the hell? I, I, I knew donating blood was blood come out. I didn't know there was an option of blood come out, then go back. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, gets the job done. Sounds like easy money, too. It's easier than GameStop. <laughs> I may or may not have, have like PTSD and don't shut up about horrible customer stories all the time. <laughs> That's what happens when you work in one place in retail for over a decade. Did you buy some of that stock a couple years ago from uh, no. GameStop? No, I did not. Oh, man. That was crazy uh, that happened. The funny thing is that the only reason that happened is because people were trying to short sell the stock. And if they had done that, the company would have collapsed. The only reason that that company didn't go under was people were like memeing the heck out of buying their stock. That's literally the only reason they're still standing right now. Yeah. Because honestly, that corporate has no idea what they're doing. I, I, from my last couple of weeks, I, I got a box and it had like chintzy Chinese ring lights and 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 LED strips and stuff for people trying to like be on YouTube and TikTok. And I was like, mm, yeah, glad I'm leaving. <laughs> what, is this, what does this have to do with the GameStop? Why is this happening? I have no idea what people want. People want cool crap. I want cool crap. Just, you know, cool statue, maybe some swag. <laughs> That's what people want. I don't know why they haven't figured that out.
<laughs> Welcome to the party. Oh, don't forget to, to do the sign in thingy. Yeah. You're here on time to scribble your name or something. <laughs> That's one of my five favorite uh, childhood movies. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It's a creepy one. <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah, that new movie that they made, I couldn't I couldn't watch it. Yeah, the uh the Disney one I heard was pretty bad. Um, mm -hmm. but I guess Guillermo del Toro made a, a live action one as well. Yeah, well, that's the CD one I'm talking about. Okay. I was like, damn, that was yeah, I really want to see that one. I heard it was cool. Yeah. Yeah, the, the Disney one is basically just a rehash of the cartoon, but not as fun. Yeah. I like the cartoon. Everybody likes the cartoon. That's why they're trying to just make the same thing and make more money off of it now. Yeah. They just announced a live action Moana, and I'm like, that just no came out. It's like, yeah. yeah. With The Rock just playing the, the usual. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like why? 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 Just why? I, you know, if they give me like a, like an actual dude in a little chicken outfit, I'm down. <laughs> I am down for that. Surprised they haven't live action frozen yet. Well, that would be nice to see. And I'm um, one of the few people that seems to have hated Frozen and like Tangled. Oh, Tangled. Like that's my idea of a Disney princess. Somebody went running around whacking everybody with a freaking black frying pan. Yeah. 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 All right. Yeah. Uh, you're my you're one of my favorites now. What? Does that mean I can't play music? Not super loud, no. I'll some more. Some of them are really freaking good. Yeah. There was one animated movie a couple of years ago. I got dragged to a theater by an ex and up for a little brother, and none of us knew what the heck it was. And like, oh God, it looks low budget. I don't know if this is going to work out. This is uh, Kubo and the Two Strings. And it was, it was freaking good. Yeah, like, it's better than most of the Disney movies. It was really good. Like legitimately, I was like, "Oh my god, why have I not heard of this?" So, how you guys doing? Everybody having a fun night? Pretty excited to do math stuff. Yes, sir. That's the spirit. So, majority of what we're learning in class, how much of it is going to be on the test? Uh, skill wise, 100% of it. So, it's been a while since I took it, so I don't remember. That's fair. Um, at some point, I swear I had, I remember it having a little bit of geometry. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> don't mess it up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure, whatever. And that case is last time. We do not have the baby of the Taiwan. Three practice tests. Four entire story. Yeah, that looks familiar. Right. 
Well, let's just take a glance at this guy. Yeah, so. Only 25 questions? I, this on the practice test, I'm not sure how many are on the actual one. I'm longer, <laughs> I can tell you that. But yeah, you're gonna immediately get hit with like tougher algebra stuff. Um, stuff like this. So right now we're basically just doing the, the fundamentals to lead into it. Okay. But yeah. Um, Everything at this, yeah, everything at this level is basically, you're not going to be questioned specifically on this. These are going to be bits and pieces of other questions. So for the most part, I'm not sure in terms of the process, uh, how much of like long division, what have you, you need to know how to do on paper. Um, but it's it's a good skill to have, and problem solving skills are kind of the name of the game, right? Yeah. Um, you if you get a formula in front of you and you've never used it before and you don't understand that what it is, the idea is that I want to be able to give you enough skills to the point where you could kind of wing it and pull it off. Right. So I usually just skip those questions. Yeah, I'm trying to avoid that. <laughs> I'm to avoid that. I don't know if they're going. Well, I got to avoid it now. Yeah, like, uh, yeah, they, they, these are kind of ugly to teach to people in, in college algebra. So some, some of the stuff actually does um, overlap with college level math, which is kind of funky. Um, you know. Yeah, about the same as like, yeah, algebra two-ish in high school kind of overlaps college algebra a little bit. I've I've heard a lot of, I've never seen this before and then pointed out, yeah, you have. But yeah, lots of, a lot like it's, the way that the tests are usually given, um, they're usually word problems with multiple choice answers. Uh, so you could do the whole like fill in the little circle thing. Yeah. Um, but that's why I'm taking the high set test. Yeah. All multiple choice. Well, this was clearly a very useful page to have in a PDF that you can look at on the internet. I like that. that's the best looking one so far. Uh, uh, I figure you probably like this one more. <laughs> that one's my second favorite. Oh, this is actually pretty useful. It has uh, has explanations. Well, that's like actually useful. Let's just go ahead and and this is on that drive that you sent in the email, right? I'm going to say no for now, and yes, yes, it is. Cool. I'm keeping that email forever. Okay. That works. Yeah, so I try to have as many resources as I can in here. If there's something you guys think of that might come in handy that I could like track down and throw in here as well, let me know and I'll, you know, figure it out. And the actual test answers? You know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I could find that. It, it was worth a try. Oh, I see. One of these is from 2016, one of these is from 2017. Fun. Fun, fun. Fun. Now, one thing I've found on the internet is that a lot of times if you search for practice tests, uh, everybody wants to sell it to you. And I feel yes. like that's really messed up. It's like legitimately messed up. There was um
think uh, how to do I have it on my channel? Oh, uh, huh, okay. Well, that's annoying. At one point, I'll, I'll track it down again, but at one point I actually found a, uh, I found a playlist where somebody had taken all the Khan Academy lessons and compiled a list of all the ones that were on like a GED practice setup and just made a huge playlist. The downside is that it was like 200 videos long. The upside of that is that they're all like five minutes. So like, if there's one thing that you're having trouble with, you can always go and take a look. Ah, all right. Well, I've been ranting for what, nine minutes? Is that a rant? I don't think it's a rant. Yeah, it works. So yeah, let's get started. So for today, if you can't see the screen in front of you, we are going to review stuff we did last time. Uh, have a lot of fun with some long division. Look at the properties of adding and subtracting and multiplying and blah, blah, blah. Uh, look over some inequality symbols and fractions. How much of this we're going to get through? I don't know. We might get through it all really quick. We uh, and then call it good. We might end up not printing half of it. We're just going to, we're going to see how far we make it and how far everybody's feeling on it. So again, yeah. if, it, if it feels horrible, Tell me, you know, you know, constructively, not, not, oh my God, I hate math. That doesn't help. I get that a lot. Though. Okay. So last time we went over the real number system, we have natural numbers, whole numbers, integers, and rational numbers. For the most part, when it comes to kind of nice round numbers, I'll usually refer to integers because uh, those are the counting numbers that include the negatives. So you got the negative zero and all your positive numbers, basically everything but decimals and fractions. Um, whole numbers are a little bit lower on that rung, starting with a zero, no negatives on that one. And natural numbers start with one, no zeros or no negatives. Um, rational numbers, again, rational means they can be represented by a ratio. So rational is, hey, this could be a fraction. So that includes, uh, well, one, fractions. Uh, two, it includes any of the other numbers because integers, whole numbers, natural numbers, if I put those over a one, then they're a fraction, they're a ratio. You can represent them that way, so it counts. Um, you'll also have different types of decimals, decimals that end. So if you have like 7.23, when you have 5.786, and then it just stops, there's nothing else after that. That means that you could go out to that many decimal points, say, oh, we're in the hundred thousandths place. Okay, cool. It's this number out of a hundred thousand. It can be represented as a ratio, so it's rational. Um, the trickier ones are the ones that actually have a repeating setup. So like three I, point seven 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 seven. What? Huh? I was saying like pi. That repeats, right? You're a five. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Five times of natural numbers, whole numbers. <laughs> Integers, this is literally like my my immediate response to everything is your or your mom's. A, I never grew out of your mom. Like, <laughs> never did. Oh, never did. <laughs> but I usually want to respond to it when it makes literally no sense at all. You know, like, oh my God, we dropped this bottle. Your mom's a bottle. What? What is that? Don't worry about it. Yeah, no, five can be any of those because it counts as a natural number. So yeah, it's rational. It could be five over one. It could be 25 over five. 
it would be 500 over 100. That's also five. It's a bunch, there's a bunch of different ways you could say five. And irrational ones are the trickier ones. Uh, that's non terminating, non repeating decimals. And you know, I have square roots that are not perfect squares in here. Um, I guess I could say imperfect roots. I think that's a better way to phrase that. That, that covers because you don't just have square roots, you have cube roots, fourth roots, fifth roots, everything up, hundred thousandth root. Not that you'd ever see that legitimately. Okay, well, you might see that legitimately with me because I like making up weird problems. Um, the nice thing with this class is that sometimes I'm going to make up problems and I'll be able to tell you, hey, if you could get through this one, you can get through any of them. Because I always hated the classes where you'd go to and you'd be like, okay, yeah, this looks easy. And then you go, go home, look at the book and like, this is great. What is happening? Why is there why is there like 40 steps instead of two like in class? Not okay with that. I'll do the 40 step ones here and I'll give you the two step ones. Let's see. So as like last time, the visual is a little bit nicer. So we're just going to take a look at some of these and say which sets they belong to. And remember, you go to the furthest one inside, and if it ticks that box, it's going to tick all the boxes further out. So number one, we have one over three, one third. What is it? Natural number? Natural? Not quite. It's a natural number over a natural number. Rational, yeah, because it's a fraction. And since it's a fraction, it can't count as an integer, a whole number, or a natural number you kind of have to think of those as like round numbers. Um, so if you got any fractions that can't reduce nicely, then it's not going to fit as any of the other categories. Um, so yeah, that one would be a rational number because you, what was that? And if they do, what do we, if they do break down? Yeah. Well, let's look at number two. It's four over two. Uh, well, two. four divided by two is two, right? Yeah. So you have four over two, but it does reduce to a nice round number. Um, so the number two does count as a natural number because if you go all the way in, natural numbers with all your counting numbers one and up. Whole number, it counts as that because it's the same set of numbers with a zero on it. Counts as an integer because it's the same set of numbers with the negatives on them. And it counts as a rational number because you can put it over a one if need be. Or you can leave it as is, four over two, that's a ratio. So it counts. Number three, zero out of seven. It is rational, but it also counts as a few others. A whole number. A whole number, yes. Oh, yeah. Because zero out of something, if you got nothing, you got nothing. So zero over seven, is just a zero. And since it's just a zero, it counts as a whole number. So it counts as an integer. So it counts as a rational. Cool. Number four, square root of four. Natural number. You are correct, sir. Square root of four. What squared is four? That'd be a two. We already figured out that two is a natural, so a whole integer and rational. Oh, I should probably change that. Uh, number five, square root of five. Irrational. Yep, because if I punch that in the calculator, I'm gonna get something weird. What times itself is five? Well, all yeah, right, it's a, it's a funky number. We get, uh, okay. Mr. Expensive Calculator says 2.23606797499898, and that's where it rounds. Yeah, okay. That's that'll just go on forever. So yeah, we're we're good with calling that one irrational because you know it it doesn't uh, it doesn't stop, it doesn't repeat anything. So call it good there. Uh, number six, three point five two one eight three two six. 
dot dot dot. So it just keeps going. This kind of that part. Whoa. Anybody have any ideas? Irrational. Irrational, yeah. Yeah. Because <laughs> it the the thing with the decimals is if they keep going, you want to look and see if they follow a pattern. If they follow a pattern that repeats, then that usually means that you can you you can represent it by a ratio because if you divide something by an odd number, like a really funky odd number, sometimes you'll have that exact situation happen where it just repeats uh, a sequence of numbers. Um, in this case, we don't have anything repeating, so it's just big old pile of numbers that never stops. So we're going to go ahead and call it irrational because, yeah, doesn't doesn't fit our definition of anything else. All right, and number seven, one hundred thirty-five point one two one two one two. Rational because it repeats. Yeah, yeah, he said the thing. I have been stressing that. <laughs> I tried to make that one obvious. It worked. I'm proud of you. Your mother and I didn't raise a fool. <laughs> <laughs> Which is accurate. I've never met her. I not have not raised anyone with her. <laughs> She's a lovely woman. <laughs> Cool. All right. I am so tired. How do we feel about this? Are we good? Are we not good? We're horrified. It's, uh, it'll do. I'll take an it'll do. I don't know. You're coming in here with Dutch bros. I'm with Dutch bros. Um, I was almost late because of the Dutch bros. I forgot it. That's worth it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I always get the I always get the slushes that have energy drink in them because I am a child. Um, I I have no shame. I don't care. I always tell everyone Dutch Brothers is for kids. Well, yeah, I, I order a Dragon Slayer, man. <laughs> like, <laughs> for God's sake. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, all right, yeah. That's that's the adult I am. We got blue raspberry in there. Yeah, Dragon Slayer. Let's do it. All right. All right. Yeah, this Comes out green. I don't know what's going on there. I don't know what the mix is. I don't care. It tastes good. Um could be literal poison. Could be rat poison. I don't care. It tastes good. Kill me. All right. <laughs> Exactly. It's me. Here for a good time, not a long time. All right. Yeah, Mr. Disney. So, rounding. I thought I'd have a lot of fun with this one. Also, the meme. I love the meme. There are more planes underwater than submarines in the sky. That is accurate. Um, there's probably a lot of other submarines underwater as well. So, I thought it'd be fun to just do rounding. But just with one number, a bunch of different times, a bunch of different times. In fact, yeah, we're just going to have fun with that, right? So number one says, hey, we got 5,463.61. What is that to the nearest 10? All right, well, where is that stupid little spotlight thingy? Yeah. Now people can see my dot. You guys see my dot? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I know you guys can see my dot because I can see my dot. Yeah, look at that dot. All right. So rounding this to the nearest 10 place. So we go over to the tens place. Say whoop de doo we got a six. I don't care what that is. I care what the next one is. Yeah, exactly. Because, yeah, you look at the next one, say, hey, we got a three. That's less than five. So we're going to round down. That sucker is all going to turn into zeros. So we don't care about this one. Yep. Because we don't care about if we're if we're dropping the three, mm -hmm. then we don't care about the 0.61. We're rounding to the nearest 10. So all I care about is 
up to that digit. Okay. Um, now rounding to the nearest tenth, this is what I want for Christmas. Kind of goes a little bit further. You go to the tenths place. Oh my God. Say, hey, I'm at a six. I don't care that I'm at a six. I care about the next digit, which is a one. Yeah, so it stays a six. That thing just kind of drops off or turns into a zero, however you want to write it. Okay. Uh, around to the nearest ones place. Uh, we go to the ones. The next digit is a six. It's above five, which means this goes up. So it ends up being 5464. Wait, so the ones place would be. One's place being, well, if you have one dollar, oh, where is it? Yeah. I was confused for something. All good. All good. I didn't put the weird little. <laughs> uh, all right, round to the nearest thousand. Well, thousands are it's our first digit, right? So again, look at the next digit. Oh yeah, five. Yeah, it's five. It's gonna stay five, right? So we end up in at five thousand. Oh, I see. Wouldn't a blimp count as a submarine that's in the sky? No. It's made out of different materials. It is entirely simply because they have similar shapes. Yeah, does not, it does not count. Uh, no. What are, you, what, what are you doing? You flying around in a lead Zeppelin? <laughs> Uh, God, I hate myself. All right. Cool. The hell was I doing? Oh, yeah. All right. Uh, yep. Yeah. We didn't do that one yet. Round to the nearest 100. 55. 55, yes. Because I look at that digit, don't care what it is. I care what the next one is. It's above a five, so this one goes up. So 5,500. Around the nearest hundred. Yes, that is a trick question. I just don't get the eighth at the end. Like, isn't that the same? Think about what tenth means. Tenth is a tenth of a, do a dollar, right? Or a tenth of a number. So it would be here. So the next digit would be hundred. Thousandth. Ten thousands, hundred thousand, millions, etc., etc., etc. So it would be five thousand four hundred sixty. Ah, see, I made it a trick question for a reason. The hundreds place is where that one is, right? I'm confused. Uh, okay, <laughs> let me uh, let me break out this thingy. So it Matt, okay. So even if it's a ten. Or 100, it's always going to end up at the last part? Well, notice that the decimal parts all end with a th. Yeah. Oh, okay. We've got tenths, hundredths, thousandths. So when you have that sort of phrase there, it kind of implies that it's, it's fractional. It's a piece okay, so, of But there's not a number there, so it would be the one. Right? Yeah, there's nothing after it, right? Right. Yeah, yeah it's a trick question. Love it. You're welcome. <laughs> you gotta do a couple more of those. Don't worry. I got a couple more. These these are jerk questions down here. Around to the nearest ten thousand. You can't. Well, see, you kind of can because ten thousands is over here, but we only got it out to hundreds, right? So if I actually had something in those digits, what would they be? Zero. Zero. Right? So it would be. It would be this number. So then, what would it change either? Not even a little bit. And we can have a lot of fun with it. Round to the nearest million. Oh, okay. Ah, but that's the thing. If you're rounding to the nearest million, you care about. Oh, okay, okay, okay. You didn't say millions. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. If it was millions, you are correct. Okay. If it was billions, you'd be correct. Um, so but be million would be how many digits out? Three, six, it'd be the Five seventh thousand. digit, right? Right. Well, think about it. If you were rounding to the nearest million, your answer is going to be in millions, right? 
So is 5,000 closer to no millions or one million? One million? No millions. What? Yeah. I thought anything four and below, or, or is it five and below? Well, think about it. If we have kind of, oh my God, what is it? I There's a print button on this. All right, we're printing it. Where would this go? Oh, that's disappointing. I was just gonna throw it off into the universe. Um, what the hell? Why is your math coming out on my printer? Um, so we got five, four, six, three point six one, but the five is in the thousands place, right? But the number next to it is gonna be a zero if it went that far. Yeah, so it would be a zero on the ten thousandths, be a zero in the hundred thousandths, would be a zero in the millions. So. For everything we're rounding, the rules stay the same. You look at the digit you're, you're rounding to, and you say, I don't care about that one. I care about the next one. What's so the zero. 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 Okay. So that means it's going to round down. And if it rounds down, five, whole thing drops. Because okay. we're caring about the nearest million dollars. If I have... $10 million and 5,463 bucks. I have $10 million. I'm not gonna go out of my way to mention the extra five, five, five K. You know? So that's basically what's happening there is where are you rounding it? If you're counting in millions. I always like to bring up when somebody talks about the population of the country. You know, America has what? 300 some million people. There's there's a lot there's a lot we're rounding off there. We're we're rounding a significant amount of human beings off. So I always like to have these types of questions on here because it makes you think about you know you're when you're rounding yeah you're rounding to a nearest digit but you're also just kind of kind of able to get like a, a <laughs> guesstimate on like a big figure if need be. All right, do we sufficiently hate rounding now? So okay. A little bit. What? Yeah, very much. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, look, adding. We did adding. You like adding, right? You put the number, you put the other number, they go together, and you get a third number. There we go. Um, clearly I am sleep deprived. This is going to get worse throughout the entire class. I will let you know that. It'll be fun. So addition, subtraction are two operations which involve bringing two or more numbers or things together to make a new total. Numbers must be lined up by place value before the operation can take place. If a decimal is involved, that's where they line up. And again, with subtraction, if you have a large number subtracted from a smaller number, it's a special case. You kind of flip it around, do the larger number minus the smaller number. And then to compensate for the fact that you just flipped it around, you throw a negative at your answer. We like adding. So this might be jumping ahead, but. In no. addition and in and in subtraction, you have to line up the decimals. In multiplication and division, you don't have to line up the decimals. You just count the decimals and then add add that number to the to the to the answer. In multiplication, yes. In division, it's its own deal. <clears throat> we'll we'll have fun with that. Don't worry. I love long division so much. So much. You know, the awkward thing is that uh, once you hit algebra and start doing long division with polynomials and x's and y's and all of this stuff, looks more complicated. I swear those ones are easier because they're always dealing with smaller numbers. It's kind of funny how that works. All right. So let's do some maths. I'm gonna write these down. I'm gonna write these down.
So we have a thing. Hmm. Why do I have? Oh, yeah. That's a plus. Okay, cool. I was like, wait, why did I have three subtractions? No. Nope. See, I told you I've never gotten a hundred percent on a test. I always make a sign error somewhere. All right. So we got to add these guys together. Uh, now, usually I like having the larger number on top. It just kind of looks cleaner. Technically with addition, it doesn't actually matter. It'll work out the same either way. Um, but I do like having the larger number on top. So that's the way I'm going to do it. Now, one thing to keep in mind is when you're adding them with decimals, Sometimes the digits might not match up to the point that it looks nice, right? So one thing you can do is you can actually fill in kind of trailing spaces with zeros. That way it makes a little bit more sense to look over. So I'm gonna add them like so. So I'm gonna take that digit at the end. We're gonna add those together. We're gonna to have a five. And one and four gives us another five. The decimal will come straight down when you're doing addition and subtraction. Everything will line up perfectly. All right. In the ones place, we have a zero and an eight. Love that addition. Seven and a one, also an eight. And then we have four plus there's nothing here, so it just comes straight down. That's it. We can add numbers. We like adding numbers. It seems really simple, but then you go back and try to do it, and it's just kind of awkward because you, you know most people have done haven't done this since they were kids, or not at all. I know a lot of people who never actually learned any of this. It's kind of funky. Oh. Okay. And for the second one, we have this thing minus that thing. Again, I'm lining them up at the decimal point. But that decimal point will just come straight down. Now with addition, you could kind of tell that if I didn't have that zero there, if I didn't put that zero there to you know, be able to see clearly that I'm just adding nothing plus five, I still probably would have pulled off that five, right? But with subtraction, it kind of kind of breaks unless I do that. If I don't have those zeros here, we're kind of stuck before we can, you know, because I'd have to do this digit minus that digit. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to fill those in with zeros, but then we're going to have to have a lot of fun borrowing, right? So what we're going to have to do, we got to get some number in this digit. So I'm going to move. Uh, normally you'd borrow from here, but this has also nothing. So we're going to have to borrow over here. This is going to turn into a five. And I'm going to be, you know, usually you'll write a little one here. I'm going to kind of write this a little differently. Instead of just putting a one next to it, I'm going to put a 10 and cross it out. That way I can see easier that it's a 10. And then from there, I'm gonna cross that out, turn that into a nine, and that's gonna borrow over to here to be a 10. I think I like writing it that way more. And it's kind of funky if you look at how that works out because 
what we ended up doing is, you know, if you kind of think of that almost like a 600, we basically said, okay, well, we now have 500 and a 90 and a 10. So you're kind of taking that 600 and splitting it up so that you can actually work them on different digits. Okay. So what we'll do, we'll do 10 minus four, six, nine minus nine, nothing, five minus three, two, six minus two, four, four minus one, Three, three minus a whole lot of nothing. It's just going to come straight down. Isn't that fun? Easier than what? Was that easier than it looks? Yeah, because it kind of it's kind of ugly, isn't it? Yeah, I'll admit that. That's why when I started uh, tutoring at this level, I was like, yeah, I got a degree in this stuff. And wait, what? What am I doing? Oh, my God. I need to watch a video. I had to watch a video to re relearn a lot of the stuff in this class, actually. There's skills you just take for granted. You know, use them, you lose them. Doesn't matter how far you go. All right. And then for this last one here, we have the problem that we are subtracting a larger number from a smaller one. So that remember that's where we have to kind of reverse it and slap a negative on the answer. So instead of doing this minus that, we're gonna do this minus that. But the most important part of this is since we're doing it backwards, we have to remember, hey, smaller number minus a larger number is going to end up with a negative. As long as you keep that in mind, you are golden. And it's always like that mm -hmm. when it comes to polygons. Yep, 100%. Yeah, I really hate the whole, well, sometimes it's this, sometimes it's that, sometimes, because then it gets jumbled and confusing. Um, so I like to avoid that as much as possible. In fact, when we get up to like square roots, cube roots, blah, 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 um, every math class I've ever seen will teach them, like, here's the square roots. It's this easy method. Okay, now here's the, the bigger ones and it's hard and difficult and weird and you have all these different, I, I just found one method that works for all of them. And it's like, there, there we go. I could teach you square roots this way. All right, that will scale up. You can do a fifth root right now. Same method, no problems. I don't know why this stuff has to be difficult. All right, well, I think we can subtract numbers. Seven minus two, five. Four minus three, one. Eight minus six, two. And eight minus five, three. So negative 321.5. Let's see. How are we feeling on that? We feeling good? You guys think we need to do some, uh, some you guys work these problems or are we, we feeling okay? Nobody's saying, yes, Ben, I want to do more math. Let's do more math. <laughs> I mean, the answer to that is literally just, I'm going to make you sit and do this yourselves. So well, that's not fair. Okay. Oh, no. We're 43 minutes in. I kind of want to move on. <laughs> <laughs> kind of want to move on. We're doing that. In fact, we're probably just going to, like, gloss over a little bit of this, do some of the harder ones and the examples and then start with the long division because let's get to that. It's gonna be fun. Huh? All right. Let's do it. Right? All right. So multiplication division. Um, when you're doing multiplication on paper, 
Yeah, the place value doesn't have to be lined up. You just count how many digits are after the decimal points in both of the things you're multiplying together and say, yay, that's how many digits are going to be after the decimal point in my answer. So you add something 0.7 and something 0.67. You say, cool, that's a total of three digits. That's how many digits you're going to have to go out for the decimal in your answer. Otherwise, it's multiplying as normal. <clears throat> when dividing numbers, well, I don't care about explaining that part right there, right now, because you're going to see it. Um, the main thing to keep in mind, multiplying and dividing negative numbers, if the signs are the same, you will end up with a positive number. If the signs are different, you end up with a negative number. That is the only time you end up with a negative number. Negative cancels itself out, becomes positive. Positive becomes a positive, stays positive. No negatives involved. But the only time you have a negative answer is when you just have one negative on there. Or I actually did add this line here to this slide. As a rule of thumb with negatives, an even amount will be positive and odd amount will be negative. So if you have like seven negative numbers multiplied together, cool, it's going to be negative. That's that's really all there is to that. Let's do a couple of these. I like the idea of a couple of these, potentially literally a couple. I am going to go ahead and skip around. I'm going to write down number one. I'm going to write down number three. I think instead of working alone on some of these later ones, I'm going to go ahead and do number six as well. Okay, so number one, we have 17.2 times 2.6. Everybody having a blast with my dot multiplications? It's fun. It's fun. Once you get to algebra, it's like, yeah, why wasn't I doing the dots the whole time? That's why I do it now. I had a little bit of a problem with the slide to be able to figure out that it was multiplication. I was like, what are we doing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this guy's is multiplied. I I always hated that once you got to a certain level, just the symbol changed. Like if we're gonna be changing symbols in the middle of learning math, why don't we just stick with the one that's gonna work the whole time? A lot of things where I'm like, why? Why is it why? Okay. Because they said so. You're not wrong. Because a bunch of drunk Greek guys did this in the sand and on tablets a long time ago. How can we make this difficult for everyone else? I don't know. We could always have a fun way of you know making things more difficult. I am very aware of the fact that I probably don't have enough room here. I'm gonna make it work. I'm make it work. I was always one in my notes in my homework to just cram the most ridiculous amount of stuff in the tiniest corner of a sheet of paper so I didn't have to grab enough views. I was that guy. Same here. Yeah, I I could easily fit like four lines of text into one line. Like I would pull that off. Yeah, 
post on Instagram. Yeah. Yeah, like I went out of my way. I have a I have a pen that has a needle point 0 0.3 millimeter writing. Like I could I could just tiny, tiny, tiny. It's like this this line right here is like three, four times as thick. Yep. That is the most pointless thing that you're gonna hear all day. All right. And so <laughs> six times two, we got a 12. Carry that one, six times sevens is 42 plus one is 43. Six times one, oh my God, I'm stumped. One six is six plus four is a 10. This is when my pen apparently doesn't wanna work. Okay. So I got 1,032 from that, okay, that works. Now we go over to the next digit. Again, you put a zero for that line and start drawing twos of that stuff. So two times two, we got a four. Two times seven is a 14, so we'll carry that one. Two times one is two, plus one is three. So we add these lines together, we'll end up with a two, a seven, a four, and another four. Decimal placement. Decimal placement. Okay, so we got 44, 72, which I'm writing because obviously I just barely crammed that in there. Uh, and we just look at how many digits are after the decimals over here. Got one here, got one here. One plus one is two. So we're gonna have that right there. And if you're on test and you're like, oh God, I don't remember what that weird guy said about this. Oh God. One, you're gonna have a calculator. And two, if you don't have a calculator, you can look at it and say, well, it's about it's 17 times two and change, right? So you'd look at that and say, is that gonna be 447? No. Is that gonna be four? No. It only makes sense right there. If you just look over your work and say, does this make sense? Be amazed at how often you catch stupid little mistakes. It is something I have to do every time. It's great. All right. So the next one, it's not really gonna be, you know, we don't need to structure it this way. The main thing is the negatives. We have a negative times a negative. That's gonna give us a positive. And then we're multiplying another negative in. If we multiply that other negative in, then we're gonna end up with a negative number. Because these two negatives would cancel each other and you'd have a positive times a negative. So you end up with a negative that way. Yeah, again, you can just, if you're multiplying stuff together, one, two, three negatives, that's an odd number. If you have an odd number of negatives, it's gonna stay negative because all the evens cancel themselves out and then you have one more. Other than that, you just have to be able to multiply the numbers together. That's why I picked nicer numbers. Three times two is six, six times 10 is 60. So we end up with negative 60. That said, people at home don't know this, but I have one eye of Raven Simone staring at me from that meme, and it's kind of creepy. <laughs> there we go. I feel better. Okay. <laughs> We're being watched by the youngest daughter from the Cosby show. <laughs> Raven's going to get you. I saw a meme and it had a picture of Ice Cube in his rap days and Bill Cosby. And it's like one of these people is going to be arrested for horrible things, and the other one is going to be uh, going to make tons of tons of family movies. If you take that back in time, they are all going to guess wrong. <laughs> That's true. Oh, Bill Cosby, you suck. All right. <laughs> I 
I wonder how many people take back uh, him being their hero. You know, if the answer isn't all of them, I am immediately mad at it. <laughs> I, think, I don't think there's any room to argue. I would never accept a jello pudding from that man. Um, yeah. Okay, so we're going to multiply these guys together. When it comes to this, what we're going to have to do, since we have a negative times a positive, we are going to have to keep in mind that we are going to end up with a negative number. So just like the, you know, dealing with the decimal points later, that's another thing you're going to deal with is the sign. So we have to deal with that a little bit, which is fine. We could deal with that. You know? Okay, so eight times one, I like it. Eight times nothing, I like it even more, much easier to do. Eight times six is 48. So we get to carry a four over here. Eight times one, oh my God, it's an eight. Plus that four is a 12. So we're gonna have a two. Normally you would carry the one, but there's nothing there. So there we go. Then we go to the next digit. Four times all that stuff. Believe it or not, it's gonna be half of this. It is what, 6,404? It's, you know, it's half of that eight multiplied on there, whatever. All right, four times that, you get a four. Why are you not writing pen? You're running out of ink. Can I tell? No, your teacher is not high. Um, <laughs> <laughs> four times zero. I always tell people that I just don't do I don't do drugs because nobody wants to see what that would end up like. I don't want, I want to know. I'm curious. No. <laughs> you would not be the first to try. Um <laughs> that would end really weird, I'm sure, for everybody involved. I mean, as it is when I'm wrapping up donors and letting them leave the donor center, I tell them I love them. Um, <laughs> have a good day. I'll miss you. I love you. I used to do that to my old, the, you know, because GameStop, we call the other store, see if somebody is something that people are looking for. I'd be like, hey, honey, how you doing? Okay, I love you. I'd make them say it back to me over the phone while the customer was in the store. It was great. All say right. it. <laughs> He's like, I don't, I don't rank you. Tell me you love me. All right. Four times six, 24. The pen is not writing. I don't know why. Four times one is, let's see, uh, carry the, uh, yeah, four times one is four. Plus two is a six. And you were right. Yeah, that happens every once in a while. Um, not as often as I'd like. Then we add straight down. We got an eight. We got a four. We got an eight. We got a six. We got a seven. Ooh. Well, where's that decimal point going to go? We have one, two digits after the decimal here, one more here, two and one is three. So we're gonna have three points after the decimal on our answer. And then we gotta keep in mind, we have a negative times a positive. That will be a negative. So those are things that you can kind of lose. Um, you're doing this sort of thing on paper one thing you could do is maybe just put a little minus roughly where you think you're going to have it on the paper just to keep it in mind other than that all right we like multiplying we like multiplying oh like why are we learning this we're going to have a calculator anyway i don't know um 
It's in the curriculum. It's in there. Okay. It's a long division. It's long and it's division. I'm going to give you guys the heads up. The next two slides, or the next slide is hideous. It's just an explanation. You could take a picture of it if you want, because it will, you know, benefit you if you're doing this on your own on paper. Right. As it is, I'm going to kind of gloss over it because the method itself makes a lot more sense mm -hmm. when you're doing it versus when you're reading about it. When you're reading about it, mm -hmm. it seems painful. Yeah, it's so, uh, next to uh, Thor. So long division is a method for dividing numbers into smaller steps in order to tackle what would normally be one large complicated problem into easier parts. That's the might not most widely used method to handle division. So it looks complicated at first, but it has a rhythm to it. And that rhythm kind of gets easier after the first couple of steps. You do a couple of problems, it gets easier then, etc. cetera. Um, as I have down there, what follows on the next slide is a very drawn out explanation of the method that could be used as a roadmap to work between these on your own. It will look intimidating at first, but it demonstrates the loop of steps in long division. Brah! <laughs> I always like doing that. This is literally just, oh my God, there's a lot to, to writing this. I like the phone coming out and the picture being taken. I like it. All right. Respect. All right. We can, we can take a picture of this. If you want to. What am I gonna, I'm gonna say no? Why, why, would I, why would I say no? It's being recorded. It is one, it's being recorded, and two. Everybody has a link to it in their email. Like this, this is this is in there. You can just you could even pull this up and while you're in the class on your phone and follow along. That's too much. It is. I don't know why you do that. Um, it's an option. Some people like putting effort into their lives. I don't know. I disagree with it. Um, too much. So I'm not even going to talk about that. We're just, we're just gonna do it. Me explaining that a pregnant horse can run faster because it has two horsepower. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to write down the first one for now. You know, the fun thing about a division symbol, fun thing about a division symbol is it's literally saying, hey, there's kind of a fraction happening. I have a thing divided by a thing or a thing over a thing. This is, it is representing a fraction. That is your useless knowledge of the day. So we're gonna do 60 divided by eight. It is going to be long division. It is not going to be a long one. It is the easiest problem we got. So, We are going to set it up like so. Last from the past right here. So 60 divided by eight, what you're dividing by goes on the outside, what you're dividing goes on the inside. It's probably a good idea to kind of like keep the place values nice between the answer, which would be up here and the this is called the dividend. There's a dividend and there's a divisor. Now, for the record, I will never remember that. And because of that, I don't think you do either. If I have a degree in this and I don't remember that, you're probably good. Is that a terrible way to look at things? No. All right. So what you would do is you would see if this fits into your first digit, which it does not, right? Eight doesn't go into six. So you'd move over to the next digit and say, how many times does eight go into 60? Seven. Yeah. So since once you know how many times it does, you throw it up here, right above the digit 
that you are using, and you take that seven, multiply it by what we have here, seven times eight, be a 56, you write it below, and you subtract that one. Now we have a four. Now there's a couple of ways of looking at this. Now, one way would be in a fractional way. Um, if I was to be setting this up at, for an answer as a fraction, um, at a certain level, you first of all learn that, hey, if it doesn't go in any further at that point, you would say, hey, I have an R4, because you're saying, oh, our remainder is four. But what does remainder mean? It's the part that didn't divide out, right? So if it didn't divide out, then it's still in that division. So you could look at it as seven and four eighths, which would then reduce to seven and a half. So you can, through long division, actually get a mixed fraction. Um, now, another way to do things, my preferred way because you know it makes a little bit more sense is if you are told hey what if you're not done what if you're not done until you're till you're done done well we could put a decimal point here if i put a decimal point here i have as many zeros as i want on that thing right but then at that point we would have as many zeros as we need to up here as many digits as we need to up here now, the way that the method goes, you multiply the numbers, or well, you figure out how many times this goes into that, write it up here, multiply those numbers, put it down here, add straight down. Then you bring down the next digit and you view, uh, you look at it and say, okay, this is where the loop begins. How many times does this go into that? Eight into 40? Five. You say, okay, five times eight, 40, like so. Again, we subtract that line, we get nothing. We have no remainder, which means we are done. That is exactly how many times it will go in. So we have another way of writing the answer. Which one of these is more correct? They're both correct. Isn't it the same? Because yeah. it's seven and a half still. Yeah, seven and a half is 7.5. Yeah. The only one I'm not a huge fan of is the one where it's like, yeah, there's a remainder of four. What the hell does that mean? Yeah. That can come in handy in certain instances to know what's kind of being rounded off if you just roll with that seven. Um, but for now, I personally prefer the decimals because you know playing around with the decimal system right now. So when you have to divide a num uh, divide an equation, right, and you have to write it out and all that stuff, is it always the left number that goes into the? So when you have when you have this setup then yeah, it's this number going into that. You can think of this as, hey, 60 divided by eight is literally, I have a 60, how many times is eight going into it? So it's always gonna be the right number going into the, the, the left number. Yeah, that's what's happening. Because you're taking this part and you're breaking it into this, these pieces, essentially. How many times does eight actually fit into a 60? Well, seven times eight is 56. You know, the difference between 56 and 60 is four. Yeah, about, about seven and a half. Now, what if it was uh, eight divided by 60? Reverse. Or does that matter? Yeah, it's actually a good question. <clears throat> I expect it. That's a good question. I like it. Let's actually do that. 
I like it. What happens if it's the other way around? This is actually one, uh, one concept where I kept getting it backwards when somebody asked it to me once. Um, because I actually kept doing the work this way and couldn't understand why it wasn't making sense. But eight divided by 60, you can actually, all division can be written as a fraction. Now I'm getting a little ahead of myself at this point, but it's kind of like that. And eight out of 60 is, it's a small number, right? So if it's a small number, then it would stand a reason that it's gonna end up in the decimals. So what we can do when we set it up, we know, hey, this is what we're dividing. This is what's going into it. Oh my God, how, right? Well, it's not gonna go in evenly. 60 can't go into eight. So we know it's gonna end up having to be decimals. So we right away start looking into the next digit. Well, 60 wouldn't go into eight, but it'll sure as heck go into 80, right? It goes in once. One times 60, 60. Subtract that line, we end up with 20. Well, we're not done yet. So let's add another zero here. So that can come down. Now we got 60 into 200. 60, 120, 180, goes in three times, All right? So we'll have our 180. We'll subtract that. We get 20 again. <laughs> it's a repeating number. Yeah. You're seeing that, yeah? Yeah, because if you keep doing that, yeah, it will always end up with that happening. We end up with 0 0.133333. 3, 3, 3, 3. You can actually write it as a re uh, repeating part. So you can write with a little bar above them to show that, hey, that three is going to go on forever. And if I take that eight over 60, I can reduce it a little bit. Let's see, four goes into here two times, four goes into here 15 times, two divided by 15. We could have done that, that division as well and we would have ended up with the same answer. Um, but according to Mr. Expensive Calculator, that's what we got. And it is gonna go on forever and ever and ever and ever. Because once I reduced it, I'm dividing this number by an odd number. So I'm gonna get something funky. And that's an irrational number. Yup. Oh, no, no. <laughs> hey, what is, what is this? I know, I was wrong. That's okay. Me too, and we're at first, Aaron. That's okay, we all make mistakes. I make plenty, that's why I'm here. I made a ton until I got a degree. <laughs> yeah. You gotta fail upwards. Is that how it's worked? I don't know. It's working for me so far. I don't know. Cool. I like it. I like it. I like it. I want you to know that I'm going to subject future classes to that now. Well, I apologize. It, it's okay. Future classes can't hear you right now. All right. So. Let's do number two, because this is where rules start having fun. So we have negative 59.5 divided by 7.3. So here's the thing with long division. This can be done, but it's quite tricky. And because it's quite tricky, we have a way around the tricky bit. 
because otherwise it works out exactly the same as the previous ones, but it's the setup that's tricky. So the thing of it is, we do not want to do long division where there is a decimal right here. We don't want to divide by anything with a decimal. So that's a little hard, right? Now, there's a couple of ways you can deal with this, um, and it's all about perspective. Um, case in point, when I go back to here, I said 8 divided by 60 is the same as a fraction 8 over 60. Well, the thing with fractions, you remember adding fractions, subtracting fractions, you had to get a common denominator. So you can multiply them by like 3 over 3 or 2 over 2 or whatever, as long as it's a big ugly 1, right? Well, that's kind of the rule that we take advantage of with this. <coughs> since, since I can look at this as this as a fraction, since I can use the look at it as a fraction, I could also deal with it in ways that I could deal with a fraction. I could multiply this by something over itself. And if you multiply anything by one, you have the same answer, right? So if I multiply it by, you know, a billion over a billion, a billion divided by a billion is just a one. It's an ugly one, but it's a one. So that's the idea is we're going to multiply it by however many tens we need to take this guy and make it a whole number. We have to make it an integer. So since this is in the tenths place, we're going to multiply it by 10 over 10. So we end up with negative 595 over 73. Now, once you understand that, once you can see that, you don't necessarily have to write it every time this way. What you can do is once you understand that's what's happening, you could say, okay, well, if I know that that's happening here, I could still make that happen over here. I can take these decimal places, and as long as I move both of them the same amount of digits, we are still safe. So if I'm trying to get this decimal point one place over, I have to also move this one one place over. And by doing that, I'm basically multiplying by this 10 over 10. And if I keep that in mind, if I have to go over twice, then I'd have to go over twice here, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. As long as I keep that in mind, we are golden. We have a negative 595 divided by a 73. This is equivalent to our original problem. It'll have the same answer, but it's something that we can do on paper. And that's what you meant by the uh, division has its own rule for the decimals. Boy, howdy it is. So do the decimals just, just disappear in general, or, or do we worry about that later? They basically disappear. They basically disappear. Um, we might end up with decimals naturally by doing our division, um, the same way that 60 divided by 8 ended up with them. But once I've moved these over, once I've changed it, because this is now our problem. So and, it disappears. Yep, and it has the exact same answer. It, since it's equivalent, that just means it's the same problem different way of looking at it. So it's not that they necessarily disappear, it's that we are avoiding them. Okay. <clears throat> like any of my exes, they're not disappearing, I just avoid them. <laughs> <laughs> you make it sound easy. <laughs> I know. Easiest way is to get banned from their place of business. Um, no way. It only happened once, and that's because I'm like 50 50 her and her boss work there. Um, He's there. But yeah, 
I can't go to Harbor Freight anymore. Um, yeah, <laughs> Harbor Freight's not that good of tools anyway, so it's fine. No, and it still work. <laughs> they work if you don't need a good tool that'll last you a lifetime. Then yeah. Otherwise, I just get them off AliExpress now because it's literally the exact same thing. You just buy them straight from chat. I'm not gonna go and spend, give them money. I can actually get everything in Harbor Freight cheaper from China. I'll go to Harbor Freight for you. All right. <laughs> yeah. All right. The hell was it doing? Oh yeah, this. All right. So 73 going into negative 595. That kind of sucks, right? Because you don't really have a whole lot of options on figuring that out for the most part. Awkwardly enough, in long division, you have to use a calculator to fix your long division. Kind of defeats the purpose, but yeah, doing all of this on paper is kind of brutal. Um, one thing I like to do is when they're big and weird and funky like this, <laughs> um, I, I like to off to the side just kind of have like some of my multiples. Just start multiplying that number. It seems a little counterproductive, but then I can, you know, look Maybe over at a glance. And all, all I'm doing at this point is just like 73 plus 73 plus 73. I've already started, so I can't stop now. That's your answer. <laughs> what if I want to keep going? You're just wasting time then. What in this class is not a waste of time that I've done so far? <laughs> I have ranted about so much random crap. I liked our pizza conversation. Oh, my God. Have you tried it? <laughs> I want that for good pizza. Oh my god. Speaking of, of crappy fast food, KFC is advertising they have new nuggets. I do know. Not do not buy them. Do not buy them. They're not good. They are potentially about that big. Oh. I got a I, I'm not even kidding. I got a box. I spent six fifty on it for a twelve piece box. Was that big? Uh, I was like, like they were tiny. They were tiny, tiny. So they're just redoing their uh, popcorn chicken. They are a hundred percent just selling large pieces of popcorn chicken as nuggets and trying to pass it off as expensive. Almost every time. Yeah, don't do it. Don't do it. This is the biggest ripoff I think I've ever had in a fast food place in my entire life. <laughs> this is crap. I'm angry. I'm I'm fat, but I'm not fat enough, and that's why I'm angry today. All right. <laughs> Let's see how many times this go in. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Goes in eight times right there. Goes in eight times, eight times 73 was 584. I am noticed that I am not caring about that minus right here that we are dividing by. That's another thing we are just going to have to keep it in mind like with multiplication, I have a negative divided by, uh, by a positive. That means my answer is going to be negative. We can put that up there, we can have that base covered. We are good for signs for the rest of the problem. So I have a quick question. Does the um you put the eight over the five at the end of the 595? Yes. Does the placement matter? So does it matter or is it helpful? That's a big question. Does it matter? Technically, you can get away with throwing it up there blank. Um, is it helpful? It is helpful in the case that being able to keep it straight this way and being able to see where you are at any given time and how everything lines up nicely, it's useful to have it have that point or that number 
at the point that we are dividing. Um, that, that way I can see, yeah, I'm, you know, maybe I was going with the second digit, maybe I'm going with the third digit. I can keep it straight that way. Okay. It is going to work out regardless, no matter what. But it's just, it's just a good way to go. Okay. Mainly because once you start playing with decimals, keeping it lined up is nice. So if I pull down a zero, that's going to have a one. One times 73 is 73. Subtract them. What is that, 37? Let's just go until we don't want to go anymore. Go to zero. Bring down that zero, 370, one, two, three, four, goes in five times for 365. See why I have this? Took a second, but comes in handy. Get a five. So here's an interesting one. If I do this, Still doesn't go in, right? What happens? Are we done? Huh? We can be. <laughs> we can be. Yeah. <laughs> You're not wrong. We can be. Eight negative eight point one five sounds pretty good. What ends up happening is we can say, okay, it didn't fit here, so we end up with another zero, and it kind of skips over that one. At that point, you have one, two, three, four, five, six. And yeah, that's that's as far as I wanted to get. So you guys could see that happen is what happens when it skips over a decimal point. Um, at that point, yeah, it, this is you know not the nicest problem. It's not gonna go on forever. It's not gonna go on forever because it is a rational number, but it's going to go on long enough that we're not going to want to deal with it. <laughs> so, like we have 595 divided by 73. How long would it take? Yeah. So, as I've said, if it's a rational number, which this is, right? If we're doing division, we're dividing two numbers. It's the same as a fraction. All of, all the things we're going to do in division are going to end up being rational numbers. So they will all have a repeating setup. But the question is, how long is it going to be until we get there? Well, if I punch this in Mr. Calculator here, this sucker starts repeating at the ninth digit. I'm not going that far. We would be, you know, all the way like an extra sheet of paper down here. We're not going that far. So you go as far as you are comfortable and you call it good, right? Cool. I'm happy. You're happy. How do we feel about long division? Do we like it? Long. No? Okay. No, I didn't say no, it was slow. It was oh, slow. slow, okay. Slow. Yeah, you're not wrong. Waiting on an email from someone in the apartment and all I have to do is go see the Oh my God, you logged in from a different location. It's the same location you've logged into twice a week for years. Every single time I log in here, I get like four notifications. I get at least two emails. All right. Let's see here. Let's see here. I really don't feel like making you guys work, work alone too many times tonight. I know none of you want to do this long today. I respect it. I understand it. Which one's the next one? Hmm? Which one's the next one? As in subject or which problem? Solve. Five was interesting. C 
five is interesting, but it's also really cheap. You know what? I like it. I actually made that one slightly less cheap because it was originally divided by 0 0.01, and you could technically eyeball the answer. Technically. But yeah, totally just going to jump to five. And then if anybody, if, if people aren't flailing after this, I will move on. If people are flailing after this, I will do more. Flail as you will. Okay, so we're gonna do that guy. I like it. You like it? Bye bye. So, again, we don't wanna divide by a decimal in long division, that'll blow up. So we got to move our digit, uh, our decimal place over as many times as we need to until we are dividing by an integer. So we are moving over twice. So this guy has to move over twice. <laughs> now, if this one had an extra decimal point, I would not care. I would simply roll with it and have that in my answer. And actually, now that I think about it, going back to the question of, hey, does it actually matter if they're lined up? In that case, if I had a decimal point here, it would matter if they were lined up because I'd have to be very careful about making sure that I'm not off by a digit. So in this case, we would have, 23,138 divided by two. A little nicer. All right. So when it comes to decimals and long division, we necessarily don't have to do the work, all that work that we did in the last problem. Um, where we had to like times it by 10 or something like that. We could just this part, just, this yeah. part? yeah. You could just move it over. <laughs> yeah, this is the explanation for why this makes sense. Okay, okay. Yes. Yeah. I've never been a big fan of doing things and being like, yeah, I just take my word for it. It'll work fine. Okay. Uh, I like to explain, explain why things work. I have a quick question. When you're doing the decimal placement over, right? Mm -hmm. Um, if you wanted to use the 10, uh, the uh, 10 over 10, mm -hmm. would that work every single time? Or is that 10 going to be a different? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, in this case, sorry, guys. Don't apologize to them. You have a question. Questions must be answered. All right. Uh, so, question is, does the times 10 thing work every time? Well, kind of. Um, again, we were exploiting the fact that if I multiplied that last one by 10 over 10, it would move that digit one place that we needed. Yes. And we only really care about this one, this one right here. Mm -hmm. So that's the one we care about here. So if I move that digit over once, that's not coming in handy, right? I would have to move it over twice. So it wouldn't just be one ten, it would have to move over two tenths, which would be a hundred. But if you keep that in mind, that that's what's happening, yes, it will work every time. Because... Well, yeah, what's happening here with our just shifting it over is just shorthand for this operation over here. So it's just the number of zeros is the number of placement uh, decimals. Basically, yeah. Just like when uh, on the last problem that we did, it um, when you had to when the fifty wasn't big enough to go into the, uh, into the seventy three, so we had to move another zero over onto the actual answer and then drop it down. It's just decimal placement. I mean, 
kind of, yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd say that would be a different a different reasoning for that, but yeah, along those lines. Okay. Hey, a thing. How many times is two going to two? Okay, cool. I was about to fail all of you. All right. Um, <laughs> this class isn't graded. Um, <laughs> so one times two, two. I probably shouldn't have said that. Half of you are just not going to show up next time. Um, two minus two, we get a zero. Oh my God, we're done. No, we're not done. Because you still got to bring down the next digit. Even if it goes in evenly, you are still having stuff to divide by. How many times does two go into three? Once. One times two, we get another two. Subtract that line, we get a one. And we bring down our next digit, which is another one. How many times does two go into 11? Or five times. Five times two is 10. To our subtraction, we have a one that looks familiar. Bring down our next digit though, which is three. And one thing is that if you start, because I'm bringing this up because I'm starting to lose my place up here. I'm not even gonna lie. Uh, you can just kind of draw arrows if it helps. You totally do that. I'm doing that because I'm starting to be like, where, wait, where am I? Okay, two goes into 13. Six times. Yep, six times two, 12. Track that guy, we get a one. Eight comes down. Two into 18 is nine. Gives us an 18 here, which means it went in evenly. We have no remainder. Makes sense because this is a big ugly even number. Yeah, pretty much. How do we feel about this, guys? Do we need to see more? Do we good? I feel great about this. Let's see where where this is going to end up in the long run. Yeah, it's the decimal placement says it was getting me. Let's show you uh, where this ends up. No, I'm good. I you quit. Do that. You do that. Ooh, I quit. That I like that one. Yeah. Beautiful, isn't it? Is that going to be on the test? No. <laughs> Thank you. <about> it. <laughs> <laughs> I look nice though. Uh, funny enough, I honestly, I really do think that this is easier than that. No. It's like, yeah, it really is. Like, hey, how many times uh, would I have to multiply x by to get the 2x cubed? Well, I need two more x's and the two. All right, 2x squared. Yeah. Like, it, it actually, it's weirder looking, but you deal with significantly smaller numbers and you are like that last problem where I was writing out multiples of 73, never done anything that, that difficult on, on this. This is like legitimately easier once you understand it. Isn't that fun? Okay, cool. Hey, we're getting past the stuff we could just do in a calculator. <clears throat> hey, this is stuff to understand. I like stuff to understand. So this is another thing that always annoyed me when it came to how things are taught in most classes, because you would be taught uh, completely different stacks of information um, in different sections for the next couple of slides. And I always thought it was just easier we just look at them both at the same time. If there's a commutative property of addition and a commutative property of multiplication, and they both kind of tell us the same thing, then why don't I treat them the same way? 
So they're the community properties now. That's my jam. So it says that you can swap numbers over and still get the same answer. Makes sense. What happens if you have two plus three? You have five. Okay, what happens if you have three plus two? They're the same freaking things. You're adding them together. They're still five, right? That's it. That's what commutative properties are. It says that you can rearrange these things and in any order that you combine them, they're going to stay the same. Um, same thing happens with multiplication. A times B is equal to B times A. Fancy way of saying something times something else is gonna be equal to that something else times the something, right? If I have uh, five dozen, that's the same as saying I have a dozen fives. It ends up in the same thing. Either way, you end up with a 60. Um, so commutative property, why is it commutative? Because the numbers can travel back and forth like they're commuting, commuters. Again, mathematicians have no imagination. Everything is just named after what it is or what weird Greek guy decided to write it down first. So, Here's something that I decided to roll with. One, the meme is accurate. Two, um, I actually saw this in a uh, random like, meme on the internet. I'm like, wow, this is a trick you've never seen before. And I looked at it and I was like, this is just the commutative property, but like blowing people's minds. So because because the whole A times B is equal to B times A thing works, it also, those things also work if you scale them up. If I have three things added together, that equals those same three things added together in a different order. Same with multiplication. Three things multiplying together, cool. You can rearrange them, still the same three things multiplying together. So I saw something that blew people's minds that percentages were essentially reversible. 8% of 50 is the same as 50% of eight. One of them makes more sense to think about, right? I'd rather do 50% of eight. Why does that work? Because a percentage is the same as one out of 100. So what's actually kind of happening is based on that A times B is equal to B times A thing, we are basically just slapping a one out of a hundred in there and attaching it from one of them to the other one. So 8% of 50, it's the same as 50% of eight, it's four. And you can actually move that around all you want to, but this is why that makes sense. Now, how useful is this? I don't know, Let's do it in the calculators. Um, <coughs> All my teachers growing up, you are, uh, you're, you're not gonna walk around with a calculator in your pocket. That was a lie. That was a lie. I got a freaking graphing calculator off the Play Store. I'm good. Um, like, you know, such is life. We were all trained for a world that does not exist anymore. So, what is 12% of 75? Oh crap. You don't want to do that? Can't do that in your head? No. 12% of 75. 12% of 75. So the idea is that we're basically treating this percentage as the fact that percent, it means one out of a hundred, right? Now that's, you know, we haven't done my big ugly unit on percentages yet, but that's the idea. So what's really happening is we'll have 12 times one hundredth times 75. That's really basically what's happening, right? And right now that one out of a hundred is bundled with that 12. So if I move that around, because these three things are multiplied together, if I multiply them in another order, it's not going to matter. If I decide that I'm going to move that 100th over to be on that 75, 
Now I can find 75% of 12. Now you could do that a bunch of different ways. One way would be convert this to a decimal. One way would be to take this as one out of 100, multiply it over, end up with a fraction. Um, think about what 75% is. What's the most common 75 you deal with is a multiple of quarters, right? Three quarters is 75 cents. That's exactly what this means, three quarters. So what's three quarters of 12? What's one quarter of 12? Half of 12 is six. Another half of that is three. So four threes. Exactly. Exactly. Because we have three twenty-five percent of that thing. So I have three threes. It's a nine. Now there are better ways to do that on paper, but that's one trick you can use to kind of think about these things um, and just work it out. So 12% of 75. You were the first one to say it out loud, and you were the first one to say no. <laughs> I just feel like that is so like extra for no reason. That's fair. It's all it's all about how you understand it. Yeah. So gotta find more ways to understand them. That's why I like to explain things in a funky way that I've never seen that people explain them in a class. It's if I get that many people telling me that it's it's difficult and hard, then maybe we're teaching it a funky way that we shouldn't do. That's why my email is always open to constructive feedback from anyone. You know, even like just straight up non-malicious like feedback, like, hey, this sucked this time. All right. I'm cool with that. Huh? Okay, that's fair. All right. So let's look at two and three. I imagine that nobody's going to complain that I don't really feel like forcing you all to work alone on certain problems tonight. That's nice. If I have to sit here quietly for five minutes, I am going to fall asleep. <clears throat> so what problem are we doing number two? Number two, we're going to do both of those. So the idea that I'm trying to get through on these couple of problems here. Now, well, first of all, you can absolutely just grab a calculator and throw it at all of these and you should have the answer. Um, but it's not about that. It's about understanding what it is we're doing with this, how it makes sense, how we can benefit from it. So yes, I could just add left to right, three and eight, and then add the seven, then add the 12. But with the commutative properties, I can move these around and add them in a different order. And a lot of times that'll actually, you know, work out better. Like if this seven kind of bundled up with that three instead of the eight, if I had seven plus three plus eight plus 12, if I rewrote it that way, well, the nice thing is that these go together really nicely, right? The seven and the three. And then the eight and the 12 go together really nicely. So I could put these guys together. Yeah, I got a 10. I could put these guys together. Yeah, I got a 20. What's 10 and 20? 30. And just by that shift in perspective, that's a lot nicer than adding left to right. Um, and I will say that practical applications of this dealing with larger and larger equations and higher level maths, you know, it's very useful to be able to say, oh, well, if I put this piece together and this piece together, now my life is going to suck less. So 
being able to recognize that you can simplify things in that way is very useful. Um, case in point, number three, we have something that's going to take advantage of the commutative property of multiplication. So we have one half times one third times 20 times 30. And if I just multiplied straight across, I would end up with one sixth, then I would end up with 26, and I'd have 26 times 30. And that doesn't sound fun, right? But if I'm like, oh, well, the, the one half and the 20 and the one third and the 30, that would fit together nicely, right? If I rearrange that, then these go together nicely and these go together nicely. What's half of 20? 10. What's a third to 30? Not yeah. You like my response? <laughs> you ever have a teacher just look at you? Nah. <laughs> mm. Oddly enough, if it was 40, you'd be really, really close. I can kind of see where it clicked. I don't get it. You what? Okay, now I see where I was wrong because three times 10 is 30, right? Yeah. I didn't look at it like that. It's okay. Good. You good? You good? If you're multiplying, why did you subtract? What? Make that make sense to me. I don't know what just happened. Well, the half times 20, but you subtracted it and it was 10. Not exactly. No, we're not subtracting the 10 off of that. We're just saying, hey, this is one half of 20. Okay. Yeah, and this is one third of 30. Okay. Yeah, another way you could do it is by looking at it as fractions. And if you put each of these over a one and multiply across, you would end up with 20 over two times 30 over three. Each of those would reduce to a 10. That's another way to look at it. Let's you. Thank you. I can do that. I'm an ordained minister. Keep it blessed. I just got really bored one day and decided to get ordained. So would it be the same answer if the half was a point five? Yeah. It would be the same answer if this one third was point three 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 three. Three, 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 three. You have to round eventually. And eventually it would round off at a digit and then it would introduce a rounding error at that point. So that's why I kind of like fractions instead of decimals. Except when numbers just suck, then I don't know what fractions. Like if I got five digits divided by four digits, yeah, we're just gonna call it good. Yeah. See, does does the commutative property make sense, guys? How are we feeling on this? You like you can rearrange the stuff, put it together nicer. That's literally the idea. Makes sense until we start subtracting. So I've kind of already used the next property. Um, because notice that the way that I did that, I did that so certain numbers would fit together nicer. I could group things differently. Well, that's literally the next property to cover is the associative properties. <clears throat> so the that says that it doesn't matter how we group the numbers, 
which is essentially which ones we calculate first. So the associative property of addition, notice that you have an A plus B plus C each way, but there's parentheses around different pieces, right? On the left, it's around the A and B. On the right, it's around B and C. What they're saying there is that essentially you could group a couple of them together differently and add those together first, and you're still going to end up with the same answer. And that's very similar to how I did number two with the three, eight, seven, and 12, when I decided to add the seven and three together and the eight and 12 together separately. That was me associating those sets of numbers together. If I had ignored doing the associative property, technically I would have had to do seven plus three, then add the eight, then add the 12. But the associative property made that a little bit easier because I could do both at once. A little bit, a little bit nicer that way. Back of my hand is now have a blue line. All right, cool. At least it's a race. Um, so that's the idea there. The same property, notice it's written almost exactly the same for multiplication, just with a different symbol. Um, same idea. I can associate things differently in a different order with multiplication. I don't have to reorder them before I have to uh, before I do those operations. I can leave them where they are and just multiply those two guys together if I want to. That's the idea. So why is it useful? Sometimes it's easier to add or multiply in a different order or to be able to rearrange a bit. I guess I shouldn't really say rearrange because that's technically the commutative property. But you can kind of see that they're very similar, right? Associative is, hey, I can do them in a different order as they are. Commutative is I can move things around in a different way to be able to see them easier and put them together. That way. But usually if you're using one, you're probably gonna end up using the other. Um, now, as for how useful this is, um, I hate vocab. I have a terrible memory. I, I like it took me years to remember this stuff. Um, how useful is this? Functionally, extremely. It is extremely useful to be able to understand using these. Um, as for whether or not you're going to remember what they mean, it might be good. It might be good to remember it for, say, an important multiple choice test, you know. But other than that, as long as you understand how the numbers work, how you can manipulate them, then you're, I'd say you're pretty good. Now, I have a quick question about this. Yes, sir. Audrey, does it? Um... This only works if it's the same, like if you're doing plus and plus. Exactly. Yes. Because if it's times and then division and plus in the same problem, don't you have to do the times and the division first before you do the plus? Yes. Um, there's ways to manipulate the numbers to do things in different orders sometimes. But yeah, as a general rule of thumb, yeah, you absolutely have to have one, the same symbols for this to work. Um, and two, uh, if you have a mixture of multiplication, division, addition, and subtraction, you have to do the addition and subtraction last, essentially. Um, uh, that's, I usually, when I have very large complex things to add together or like I'll have something where it's a big string of multiplication, addition, division, all, all kinds of different operations happening at once. Since addition and subtraction are literally the last thing in the order of operations, I honestly usually treat pluses and minuses between big chunks of things as separators. Like, okay, I'm, that means I'm just gonna do this part first. And then there's a plus there. 
Cool. That part after that plus, I can deal with that at once. Cool. There's another plus over there. That's its own thing too. I kind of treat them like separators. Um, being able to compartmentalize problems that way is very useful. Are you going to deal with problems that big? No. No, you're not. Not for a while, at least. Associative properties. Not really a huge amount of stuff to understand for these. So I'm just going to do one and two and, you know, we can move on. I would really like. I'd like to get through at least another four slides tonight. Maybe seven. Well, it's probably wishful thinking. All right. I believe in you. Oh, uh, what? I believe in you. Ah, uh, you're so much nicer than my parents. Um, <laughs> that's the first time I've heard that in my entire life. Okay. So now, usually, when you are doing problems specifically about the associated property, these are what they're gonna look like. Now, I don't see that happening a significant amount in your future. Um, as with most things that we're all referred to them as foundations or building blocks, this is simply a concept that is going to be part of larger problems or you know, basically a tool in your toolbox. So being able to understand it, that's the goal. You're not gonna, you're not gonna do like 40 problems like this ever. So literally the idea here is to do how they're grouped right away and say, hey, I do see that it makes sense and they are end up being the same thing. Two plus seven plus three, so seven plus three is 10. Two plus 10, that's 12. Cool. Over here, two plus seven grouped together first. Two plus seven is nine plus three. Nine plus three is a 12. Yay, they are equal. That's the idea. The same three numbers being added together. You can group them however you want, add them however you want. You still got the same three numbers. They're all gonna add up to the same number eventually, right? And then number two is essentially, it does say to rewrite in a different grouping and then solve, but essentially what you're doing is you're looking at these three numbers and saying, hey, I have a 19, a 36, and a four. Which one of these, uh, which of these numbers would I like to add together first? Well, the 36 and the four, because four would fill in that, that gap that 36 has up to 40, right? So if I was to rewrite this at all, I would prefer to group that 36 with that four. So then we would have 19 plus 40, which is a heck of a lot easier to add together than adding the 19 and 36 together first, then adding four. 19 and 40, we end up with a 59. So how do we feel about these properties? Pretty good. Pretty cut and dry, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, it's going to be the same answer no matter which way you do it, right? Yeah, exactly. That is that is it for that. I mean, don't worry. We got we got more properties. We have a another property. Um, now this one actually leans into more difficult stuff. Um, distributing is incredibly useful. Um, and literally, you're only ever really going to think about it as distributing. You're never going to explicitly say, I am using the distributive property. That is not a thing that you will ever say. You're either going to distribute or you're going to uh, do the opposite of distributing, which is something that I will show in the next slide. So the distributive property, it's a property of multiplication used in addition and subtraction. So the property states that two or more terms in a addition or subtraction with a number are equal to the addition or subtraction of the product of each of the terms with that number. But it's a complicated way of saying, hey, look at this last thing. This is, this is what's happening. Distributive property tells us how to solve expressions in the form of, and I don't like how that is there, A times B plus C. So that's basically telling you, hey, if you have a number outside of a set of parentheses and there's a bunch of stuff inside that set of parentheses, you could take that number outside and distribute it to each thing inside. That is all that's saying. So if you look at that last line, you have A times a B plus C, that A would multiply times B, and then that eight would multiply times the C. So it just kind of bounces in to each individual term. So it's incredibly useful. Use it all the freaking time. Um, but it does have further applications in general in something called factors um, or factoring. So I like to have this slide in here. We're not going into factoring right away, uh, but I like to have it in here because it's so closely related. So factors with the distributive property comes references to factors. A factor is a number that can divide another number with no remainder. So, you know, if I have the number 60, uh, one of the factors of that is 12. This 12 would go into 60 evenly. Um, five would go into 60 either. Those are factors. Um, so essentially, this concept will help us kind of see the distributive property backwards. We'll be able to see, hey, I have this number plus this number. Oh, they have something in common. They have a factor in common. So we can kind of reverse distribution. We can pull those guys out of those two pieces. And then we'll have something potentially simpler to work with. So looking at the distributive property again, we can make very good use of this going in the other direction, factor-wise. So if you look at it on the right, A times B plus A times C, if you started with that, you would might look at that and say, oh, they both have an A in common. What you can do is essentially factor out that A. You can pull that A out of both of them. And then you would say, okay, I have A times starter parentheses and write A times what? Well, we had a B and we had a C, B plus C. And you end up with the left side of this if you factor the A out of both of these pieces. Makes a little bit more sense when I'm writing it down and not dealing with letters, but you know, you're going to get used to a lot of letters in here. Yeah, so you separate them by a set of parentheses to show that they're getting multiplied by that A. So I personally like to write it that way. On the last line, a b plus a c is a times a b plus c. Um, less mess to it, easier to look at. Okay. Yeah. 
examples of playing with the distributive property. That is so accurate. You also have another po proper dad selfie is frowning and holding the phone like at your chest looking upwards. So you got like this weird thumb thing happening. That's a pretty common one too. That was my dad's profile picture for years. And like, what, why, why would you do that? Um, just standard. Also, what's up with that cat? He's moonlighting the camera. He looks like he has a story to tell me. <laughs> he looks like a city to have a story to tell me that I'd be really interested to hear. Okay, so I'm just gonna write down the first one first so you kind of see this. Um, there's a little, hmm. as a math guy, it's a little difficult for me to write problems for this because every single one of these problems can be done in a simpler way. This is easier to do. It's better applied to algebra. It's better applied if this is something in X and this is just something either without a variable or with a Y or something. Because then I would, you know, as it is right now, normally I would just add these two numbers together and multiply by two. And you might look at this and say, why the hell would I not do that? Because this has useful properties later. This is an under not useful thing to understand because it will come up again later over and over and over again with more complicated concepts. So we're learning the easiest ones first. So we should scale up. Bless you. Okay, so the idea, nicest way to write it, kind of like that. We're going to do the two times the three, we end up with six plus the two times the four, eight, and we can add them together, 14. And again, the concept we're trying to get is being able to see, hey, if I have a thing outside of a set of parentheses, multiplying, well, essentially, if you have it right outside that parentheses, it's implied that it's multiplying right away, first of all. Um, and second, it can distribute to each item inside of that set of parentheses. That's what we're trying to get down. No, I don't like it. Let's do number three. So number three says solve by factoring out with the distributive property. Yeah, I know I said I wasn't gonna do it. I'm doing it anyway. I didn't choose Thug Life, Thug Life chose me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm down to Bob. Yeah. Can you tell I'm from the Valley in California? <laughs> Not yay, sunny LA, California. It's freaking Stockton. Somehow I didn't get shot. And now I'm here. All right. <laughs> If I was there, can you tell that my mouth would currently get me shot when if I was there? I would. Hey, don't don't tell this guy that thing. Oh, that's the first thing I'm gonna do. Oh, it's like a button in the back of my head. Don't press it, gonna press it. Okay, so the idea here is that the distributive property can make something like this much simpler. By looking at this, I don't have to necessarily do 16 times 6 and then add that to whatever 16 times 4 is. What I can do is say, hey, both of these have a 16 in common. So what I can do is I can pull out that 16, start a parentheses by saying, hey, oh yeah, 16 was multiplied onto each of these, so now 16 is multiplied onto what? Well, there was a 6 here. Plus, we got the plus in the middle. 16 times what over here? Four. 
Okay. So we're just pulling the 16 out. We have a six and a four. No, we don't have to distribute. If we distribute, we end up with this. What we can do is add these together. What's 16 times 10? It's 16 with a zero at the end, that's 160. But what about the other 16? There isn't another 16. There's two 16s right there. That's the idea though. We are factoring the 16 out. What we're doing is we're saying, hey, this was 16 times each of these. So if I pull a 16 out, then it's 16 times both of them combined instead of separate. We are kind of simplifying what it is that we're working with by saying, well, we don't have to say it's 16 times these things individually. We can put them together and say it's 16 times one thing. Does that kind of make more sense? Yeah. It yeah. yeah. If it doesn't, you can always look at this as distributing back out and you would have that 16 times six again, plus 16 times four, just like the last problem. We are undoing that distribution. We are pulling it out. This is where it would normally come in very, very handy. What else we got? Hey, let's do number five. Because, like, look at that. There's a lot of sevens. We have six times seven plus two times seven plus three times seven plus five times seven plus four times seven. There's a lot of sevens there. Yeah. So, would you do the same thing here and just take out all the sevens? Totally. Because we can recognize that every single one of these is multiplied by seven, we can pull that seven out and say it is seven times the collective what was left if I don't have a seven there. Six times seven, if I pull that seven out, guess what I got left? That's six. Plus two times seven, if I pull out the seven, plus three times seven, if I pull out that seven, it's five times seven. If I pull out that seven, four times seven, I pull out that seven. Okay, it makes a little more sense now. Yeah. So the most common number gets pulled out. Essentially, yeah. I mean, that's how I understand it. That's how I understand it, right? It is the thing they allow in common, yes. Is something that will be referred to in a week or two as the greatest common factor. Hey, you know what I like? I really like those uh, commutative and associative properties. Like uh, if I decided, if I decided to associate this four with the six, that would be a ten, and then two and three is five plus another five. So that's another 10. Gotta love those commutative and associatives, right? So we end up with seven times 10 and 10, 20. Well, seven times two is 14, and that has a zero at the end. So there's a zero at the end, and there we go. So doing it that way is a lot nicer than. Six times seven is something, plus two times seven is something, plus three times seven <clears> is something, <throat> five times seven, four times seven, blah, 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 blah. Now, would that still work if at the end of the equation, uh, at the end of uh, plus four, four times seven, if there was like um, a 10 times eight, 
you would have to add that at the end of the parentheses and do that last, right? So yeah, what end what end up happening is you would say, oh, that seven's in common here, but that is in common there. So okay. yeah, it just wouldn't it wouldn't come into play at all. Okay, so you just take all the common stuff first, and then yeah. do the oddball stuff last. Yeah, exactly. Cool, 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 cool. cool. <clears throat> I'm tired. Close enough. We're done. Is that, is that acceptable? <laughs> did, did we get through your uh, wishful thinking? Ah, pretty much, yeah. Yeah, we're good. Everybody happy? Yeah. You're all happy? It makes sense now, yeah. It was a good yeah, lesson. I had another 10 slides. Oh, God. You guys are going to have to deal with that on Tuesday. Speaking of, do some essential education homework over the weekend, please. If you have questions on any of it, send me an email. I might be at work, and if I'm not, I will email you back. Okay. I Are you sending us an email? Later, Anybody online have any questions? Yes. Are you sending us uh, the link over email? What link? Uh, the homework. Or did, did I think that you said that? Oh, it's the uh, Essential Education website. Did you okay, my, I got gotcha. uh, Huh? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know which one you're talking about. I've got the uh, the paper okay. for that one. Then, yeah, just on that. Okay, perfect. I thought you meant like you were actually sending out homework. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> no, I, I don't have I don't have time to grade it. I got a full time job. That would that would kill me, like legitimately. Yeah, counterproductive. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, they made me do that. I'd probably quit. Not gonna lie. <laughs> All, All right. right, buddy. Have All a good right. night, dude. You too. If you guys need anything at all, just shoot me an email. All right, brother. Have a good night. Have a good weekend. Happy Easter. Yeah. Discount chocolates. Discount That's on chocolate. Tuesday. Yeah. That's all that matters. <laughs>